One of the most beautiful sights nature has to offer is a sky full of stars. They are beautiful, mysterious, and wishes that have yet to come true. An unborn life is like a star. Although the face of the baby has yet to be revealed, all of creation knows she bears the image of God. And nature eagerly awaits for this life to draw its first breath. Our mission is to help our clients discover what creation already knows. Along with a precious unborn life, each of them was fearfully and wonderfully made by our Creator. His love for us outnumbers the stars in our vast universe, and He has a special purpose for each. You make it possible for us to help men and women explore the miracle of life. Our educational and support programs will equip the new mom and dad on their new journey. If they've chosen abortion in the past, we offer healing through our post-abortion ministry. Won't you join us as we help save what God has created? You can volunteer your time, donate a financial gift, your professional services, or be a church liaison Contact us today to see how you can be a vital part of making these wishes come true. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Romans 8:19. We're going to be starting the book of Philemon, but we're barely starting the book of Philemon this week. This is really kind of an introduction to the book. Hope to go for, through just the first few verses, and then we'll be going into Philemon uh, in depth next week. Uh, we'll be really getting into the body of the book. It's just a one-chapter book. And so those who miss this week will be totally lost for the next two. But you'll be on. So cool. So last week we talked about uh, uh, kind of what Peggy was talking about a little bit, about all of us being broken people. And about how we have this human problem of sin and this bent towards sin and this bent towards selfishness that's inside of every one of us. And I think we can even be a little more specific than that and say we have this default setting to think that we are better than a certain number of others. It's just kind of in us, I think, from birth. I think that's part of the sin. The, when we went through Acts right before Christmas, if you remember, there was this dilemma because... The church started going out to the Jews, and then there was this direction, there was this, this conflict. And so then the gospel started going out to Gentiles. But when the gospel went out to Gentiles, the Jewish people were upset. And then when it went out to Samaritans, they were upset because they thought, that God is for the Jews. We are the chosen people. And they missed that whole concept that they were chosen to bring the gospel to the world. They weren't chosen to hoard it unto themselves. And so they thought they were better than others, that God somehow liked them more than others. And I think we do the same thing. By the way, is Lawrence here? He is not here today. He's wandering. He's doing security. Well, if you, if you see Lawrence, um, tell him Happy Yom Kippur or something. Because I just saw on, on Facebook that they did this ancestry thing, and he found out he's Jewish. He never knew. So if he looks down on you today, you know why. Anyway, so, so Philemon is a book about slavery. About, it's, about, it's this cool book about this runaway slave and, and all the things that are going on with it. So that's why we have to do background because if we don't understand slavery at the time, we're not going to really get it. But So I'm looking up about slavery today on the internet to try to draw some connections. And, and I got this one quote that, that modern slavery tends to be a by, uh, quote, a byproduct of poverty. That is so untrue. Poverty tends to make, lack of opportunity tends to make a bad situation worse. But just like the quote from the politician I gave last week, the problem is us. The problem is that bent towards sin. It's our selfishness. It's our thinking we are better than others. That's what brings modern slavery? 
According to Reuters, there are 1.5 million U.S. victims of trafficking in the states today. If trafficking is simply a byproduct of poverty, how can we have a million and a half victims in the United States? I read where, and this figure seems awful high, but I read where about one in seven teenagers runs away. And within three months, 90% of those are trafficked. Why? Because there's a demand. There's a desire for money, and there's a, there's a demand for the sex. We are messed up people. And here's a hard thing to swallow, is we are no better than those who pay for those children. We too are messed up. We too need God's redemption. We too need to be washed clean. We are no better than others. All life has value. By the way, there's a, a movie, if you're interested, just watching the trailers hard enough, um, called Blind Eyes Open, and that's on the human trafficking, but it also gives the gospel, and that's going to be at Cottonwood Theater at 7 o'clock on Thursday. But let me see what, give you what kind of got me leaning into this a little bit and understanding how I can think I'm better than other people. So there was a, gosh, some time ago when the men went and worked at the rescue mission, I think it's called, has a different name downtown now, but anyway, the, the Albuquerque Rescue Mission, and we went in there and we're doing breakfast for these uh, folks that are homeless. And so I'm in there after we're serving breakfast and I talk to people and then we serve another group to kind of come through in waves. And so I'm talking to this kid and he's in his, his, tw his early 20s and, uh, and he was dressed a little nicer than, than most and so we're shooting the breeze and I asked him, uh, I said, so uh, can you tell me your story? How come you're homeless? Where'd you sleep last night? Because it was really cold. He said, well, there's this old jail that we can sleep in. And uh, so that's where I crash. And then uh, uh, I come here for breakfast to the mission. And then I go off to my job. I operate a kiosk in the mall. And I said, oh, that's cool. Well, how come you, know, how come you don't have a place? And he said, well, me and my parents uh, dealt drugs uh, out of the house. And I got caught. And so I got out of jail a while ago. And still, I'm, I'm still in probation. I got an officer. But I can't go back home. Because if I go back home, then I'm going to be in the middle of the drug thing and I'll get busted again. And I'm clean now and I don't want to go back into that. And so he said, I actually have enough money for an apartment. I've raised enough money, but I don't want to move in without furniture. It'll be depressing. So I'm looking for stuff on Craigslist. And I'm, you know, I've kind of figured out the system here and I'm earning a little bit more. And so it was interesting to me because I thought, okay, here's a kid who's dealing drugs with his parents. If I had brought drugs into my house, my parents would have gone to jail for homicide because I'd have been dead. <laughs> you know, I mean, total different history. And so there's this, there's a surprise at seeing this kid in there and then this realization that had I grown up in his home instead of in my home, we would be trading places. And would I be sharp enough to make it on the street and do what this kid was doing? And just to lean in a little further, since uh, I was able to go through the training and just this last year, I've been able to, to work with some, the, some folks at CareNet. I just get called in when there's a, a guy who doesn't have anyone to talk with. And, and I'm realizing, talking to these guys, that I, too, in their place, would be consider, considering abortion. I'm not saying it's ever the right choice. I, I'm not saying it's ever right. I'm just saying with the lack of any home support and the lack of any support around them and, and being in their late teens and their life ahead, I get why they're going down that road. And that's the beauty of CareNet because it gives all that support, right? It gives everything that, you know, all the, all the financial and the training and all the stuff that they need. But I never realized what I got growing up in a Christian home. I actually knew what a marriage was supposed to look like. I knew what commitment was. I saw my parents raise us, and of course my parents weren't perfect, but I had a good example of how to raise kids. Here we have kids raising kids, and, and they're alone, and they don't have any of that. And so it's so easy for me to think that I'm better, and in the fact of the matter is I've just been more fortunate. We need to understand that we are all broken. 
Our first heart attitude, we have little mouse pads in the back that have seven heart attitudes on them. And the first one that they all come out of, and it comes from Philippians 2 verse 4, is put the goals and interests of others above yourself. Put the goals and interests of others above yourself. I would like to suggest that we all struggle with doing that. If you don't think you struggle with that and you're married, let me ask your spouse. <laughs> Do they put the goals and interests of you above themselves? And if they lie to me, then let me sit in the back seat of your car for a week. Here's the amazing thing. There is one person who lived their life who was always good. There's one person who lived who really is better than us. And that man, Jesus Christ, put the goals and interest of you over his own. That's our example. So today we're talking about a runaway slave. So I'm going to go first about what we kind of know about the situation and what Philemon knew and then what Philemon didn't know and then we'll see if we can get a couple verses in. So here's a, first a little bit about what Philemon knew. And he had been a friend of Paul's. So Paul started a church in Ephesus. Remember, we went through Acts. He's on his missionary journeys, and he goes to Ephesus. He starts a church there. It's not that awful far from Colossae, and, and uh, that's where Philemon lives. And so Philemon has come to Christ. He and Paul end up becoming buddies. And so he would have known what went on in Paul's life. Now, you may remember, if you can stretch your mind all the way back to pre-Christmas, when we went through the book of Acts, that Paul, after his three missionary journeys, he collected a bunch of money to bring to Jerusalem. And people tried to talk him out of going to Jerusalem because they were afraid he'd get arrested there. And he said, no, 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 I got to do this, I got to do this. And so he collects all this money. He travels 800 miles to Jerusalem. And people couldn't figure out why he wanted to do that. And I really think the reason he was insistent on going to Jerusalem is because the money was collected by a bunch of Gentiles for a bunch of Jews. From Gentile churches to this Jewish church in Jerusalem who was in the middle of a famine and, and hardship and they needed the money. He's trying to unify the church, see, to, to, to bring it to peace, to bring them together again. Because the Jews thought they were better than the Gentiles, but now the Gentiles are helping the Jews. It's this really cool story. So Paul goes out there, he brings the 800 bucks, he, he gives it to the people, and sure enough, he gets arrested. So he gets arrested, then he goes to Caesarea, which is the very beginning of the red there, which was kind of the beach property in jail. So anyway, he enjoys the beach breezes while he's in jail there. And, uh, and you know, after being there forever and, and not being able to, to get anywhere, he pleads his case to Rome. So that's when he travels that weird journey. And remember, he goes through a shipwreck and they, they land on this island and the snake bites him and all that kind of stuff. Do you remember those stories? Did anybody listen? Peggy listened to my last sermon. You heard her. Anyway, so he, so he finally gets to Rome and then he's sitting there for a couple of years waiting for his trial before Caesar. That's where we left the book of Acts. Well, then that brings us to Philemon. Now, so Paul's sitting here in Rome. It's around 61, 62 AD. He writes a couple books, uh, uh, letters. One letter, uh, Colossians, he writes to that church that Philemon is at. And he ends up writing another letter to Philemon. Now, here's what we know about Philemon. We know he's from Colossae. And we know he's rich, and we know he's a slave owner, and we know he's a good guy. There were a number of slave owners in the church uh, in Colossae that we find out in Colossians chapter 4. Philemon's come to Christ by Paul, and he still has slaves. We figure he's rich because the church meets in his house, and the assumption is you want the biggest house you could get for the church to meet in. So he's got a big place, maybe a big upper room. Now, the church began meeting in the temple and homes, but now they are, you know, there's persecution bouncing around the empire, so they're just meeting in homes for about 300 years before they go back to churches again when it's safe enough. And his wife and his son go to church there with him, and he has some slaves, we don't know how many, but one is named Onesimus, which means useful, and Paul calls him useless. So he has this useless, I assume, a lazy slave named Useful that decides to run away. And my assumption is, I mean, he may have been thieving the whole time he was there, but in order to run away, he steals some more money. So he's got this 
thieving, lazy, lousy slave who runs away from home. Now, I said a while ago that Philemon was a good guy and he was a slave owner. And for us in America, it's hard to put those two together. So I'd like to back up a little bit and talk about what slavery was like in Rome because we go back to the early 1800s, right? And all these horrible stories and things that went on. So let me explain what it was and where God's going to bring Philemon. About a third of the empire was slaves. A lot of slaves. Another third of the empire was former slaves. So two-thirds of the empire had something to do with slavery, and that doesn't even include the owners. Uh, a lot of them were sold into slavery, but primarily what happened is when Rome conquered a territory, if there was a lot of pushback, if they had to do a lot of fighting to conquer that territory, they would make the people in that territory slaves. So it wasn't racial slavery, and it wasn't trafficking like here. It was, this is a conquered territory, you're going to be our slaves. That happened when Rome was expanding. Now, by the time this book is written in 61, 62, these are children of the slaves that are slaves, right? They're, they were born into slavery. There's another group that became slaves, which is what made the number so big, and that was people that chose slavery. And you say, oh, that doesn't make any sense. But th think what life would be like with absolutely no government assistance when things go bad. There's no welfare, there's no food stamps, there's no unemployment. There's, so unless you've been able to save money or have family, there's no government help for you when you're hurting. And so people, when they're hurting, they're living on, they're living on the street like this kid I talked to, but there's no outside help for them. Well, at least if I sell myself into slavery, I've got food, I've got clothing, and I've got shelter. And so without any other help, a number of people, and because you're selling yourself into slavery, you can find out who a decent owner might be, right? You're not going to sell yourself to the jerk, but you find out there's somebody who's a decent employer and you sell yourself to them. We've now learned that the occupations of slaves and masters aren't much different. There were slaves that were doctors, musicians, teachers, artists, accountants and full industry. In fact, most of the industries were run by slaves. By AD 20, and Paul's writing this in AD 61 and 2, uh, they were able to go to trial. They were able to keep property. They were often paid. And it wasn't uncommon for the master to set the slave free when they died, to have that as part of their will. So the average time people were in slavery was 7 to 20 years. So do you see how that's a little bit different than what we had? But that's the good part. There's a bad part, because a slave then is like a slave now, a slave was owned. And Rome was afraid of the slaves. You've got one third that are currently slaves, you've got another third that are former slaves. That means two thirds of your country is like, you know, could band together against the one third. So they were afraid if the slaves ever got together, they could be overthrown. So what they did is they have massive laws against runaway slaves. And they had slave catchers that would go catch the runaway slaves. And when you came back, then the owner could do whatever the owner wanted to do. And it was very common to be branded on your forehead as a runaway. Uh, another common treatment was to be worked to death just literally worked to death because you had been a runaway. Uh, one lady I read about uh, decided she would crucify her slave for her own enjoyment. So it's a real mess. Now, here's what Philemon didn't know, and that is that his slave Onesimus, when he ran away, went to Rome. He doesn't know where his slave is. But Onesimus, and I doubt it, it, it went according to that black arrow because they didn't have American Airlines back then. But somehow, <laughs> somehow Onesimus gets there, right? So he steals a bunch of money and he hops a ride on a chariot one place and I don't know, he steals somebody's horse and he takes a ship and somehow he gets over to Rome. While he's wandering around Rome, as God would have it, coincidence of coincidences, that's the same time Paul is there because he's been delayed because of all the shipwreck and everything. 
And Paul is under house arrest, which means he can leave the house even though he's in chains. He has a Roman guard and he's able to preach. So there Paul is preaching on the streets in chains, but totally free in how he's sharing who he is and what he's doing. And there's Onesimus without chains, but totally under this cloud of slavery. So the chained one is free, but, and the free one is kind of chained. And so Onesimus hearing Paul's story about he can be set free from his sin and free from this mess, he ends up coming to Christ. He gives his life to him. And I don't know how it happened, but I figure one day they're sitting there and they go to the local Starbucks and, and they're having some Roman coffee and hopefully it's nothing like Cuban. And they're, they're, they're drinking their coffee and they're having this good time together. And so he says, well, tell me about your story on this. And you know what, what happened? And he said, well, you know, I used to be the slave. There was this guy in, in Colossae and, and uh, I, I just couldn't stand it. And I hated it there. And so I just, I just had to run away. And he says, uh, Colossae, I, I, I know a few people there. What's his name? His name's Philemon. Ah, he's a friend of mine. I led him to Christ. In fact, the church met in his house, didn't it? Well, yeah, it did. And so then they get talking more and more, and I assume some time goes by, and Onesimus reads Philippians 2 and comes out with the application, I should put the goals and interests of others above my own. And somehow, you know, we have these little stickers in step with the Spirit. Somehow he figures the Spirit is leading him to turn himself back in to his slave owner. Sometimes the Spirit asks us to do some radical stuff, extreme stuff. And so he goes with a guy named Tychus. We find out from uh, Colossians he couldn't go alone. He, he might get caught. And they bring these two letters back to Colossae, the letter of Philemon and the letter to the church called Colossians. So here's what we're going to do is you're just going to unpack uh, the first three verses, I think, that bring us far enough so that we can, we can start off running next week. By the way, we have Bibles in the seats. If you don't have one at home or if you need to give one away to somebody, just take it home, give it away. We'll get more. And, uh, and please feel free to, to write in there. So sometimes when we get home from a trip, we take the suitcase, we dump it out, we go through it and find what we want, and we kind of leave it on the bed and grab them and go. And sometimes we unpack scripture that way. This time, though, what I want to do is just start right at verse 1 and just un look at one piece at a time. So it begins, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, or Paul, a prisoner of King Jesus. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I read through the book a couple, three times because um, it's short when I was getting started. And all of a sudden that came out to me because Paul usually starts his letters, Paul, an apostle. Well, okay, he's starting Paul a prisoner because he wants Philemon to connect. Um, Onesimus is kind of a prisoner being a slave, and Paul's a prisoner. Okay, I, I get that. And so I kind of brushed over it, but then all of a sudden I said to myself, self, I said, why is he a prisoner of Jesus? Isn't he a prisoner of Rome? He's in a Roman prison. Or the Judaizers who are trying to, you know, get him killed. How come he's a prisoner of Jesus? And it finally dawned on me, all Paul had to do was say, nah, I was kidding. He, never, he didn't really rise from the dead. I'm not going to share that anymore. Uh, I don't really believe that stuff. And he's free. He's a prisoner of Jesus because he's locked into Jesus. He's, he's just a full, all-in, step-with-the-spirit Jesus follower. And he he can't say, I don't know Jesus. He can't say he didn't rise from that. He can't. So his jail is an act of worship. In fact, uh, Paul, a prisoner, you can take the, you could scratch the word a out of your text there because in the Greek, if you go like Bible Hub or Blue Letter Bible, it's not, the article's not in there. It's just Paul prisoner. Like Jesus Christ, Paul prisoner. Here's my name. I'm Paul prisoner. That's just who I am. I'm a prisoner of Jesus and whether I get free from here or I don't, I'm, I'm still his. I am all in. And because he's a prisoner of Jesus, Onesimus comes to faith. I think, again, you know, the application is whether you're in jail or not, whether you're serving time or not, whether you're struggling with a pregnancy or not, whether you're a runaway slave 
or you're in the middle of last week, we talked about, you know, the three-year regret. You've just been far from God, and you're saying, man, I, I, I've got to come back. No matter where you are in there, you have value. God has a plan. He's on it. His grace is chasing you. And then he goes on. He says, I, okay, I'm, I'm Paul. I'm a prisoner of King Jesus, and, and to Timothy, our brother, and Timothy would have known Philemon, kind of like Paul's second in command. And to Philemon, our dear friend, our fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister. Now, Timothy and Aphia, they're not blood brother and sister. I think they're saying, you know, brother in the Lord, sister in the Lord. But please don't call me Brother Dan. Anyway, uh, we think Aphia may have been his wife, and then Archippus, who comes next, may have been Philemon's son. Calls him a fellow soldier. They may have spent time together in jail, actually, for the faith. And to the church that meets in your home. Now, that's another kind of weird phrase to me. Because I'm sorry, if I'm, you know, uh, if I'm out of town and I write Chris a letter, I'm not going to say, hey, Chris, and Anchor Point Church. Oh, that's just kind of weird, right? I'm just going to write it to Chris. Who cares? About I'm, I'm writing it to him. And he's already writing the, the, the Colossians, a letter to, the, to them. So why is he writing it to Philemon and the church? We talk about being in step with the Spirit. If Philemon will be in step with the Spirit, the result of this letter will not only affect his life, but the grace of God through Philemon will affect Onesimus' life. It will affect all of his slaves. It will affect the church in Colossae, and it, and it can go out of there to the world. This is a ch radical church affecting letter. This is a major deal. So he said, I'm writing it to Philemon, but you know what? This whole church is going to read it. And what he does is going to bring heaven or hell on the congregation. Sometimes our choices just have major effect. There, you know, Colossians 4 talked about, you know, there's other slaves. There's other slave owners. What he does is going to matter. So we moved here like 15 years ago and we had been here, we were still in our rentals. It had to be in the first year. Maybe we were here six months or something. We had to go back to Winnipeg for something. We were going to be gone a couple weeks. And there was this family kind of loosely associated with the church. We'd helped out a number of times. They, had, uh, um, they needed help, you know, with apartment rent and living, lift, living conditions and things. And so we, we had helped this couple out. And um, then they lived in a house for a while. Uh, and then the house burned down under questionable circumstances. So that was being checked into. And now they needed a place to stay. And we were going to be gone. Part of the time they needed a place to stay. And so I had to answer, was our house going to be open for a couple of weeks for this couple to be in? And, you know, they had had jail time and all the stuff in the past, you know, the stories a lot of us have had. And I'm saying to myself, self, I said, I'm not so sure I want them staying here. I mean, it's just a rental, but you have stuff, right? And some of the stuff may not be valuable to anybody else, but it means a lot to you. And anyway, I found out before us, they were going to be staying with Dan and Irene Lukenhoff for a couple of weeks, or not with them, but they were going to be staying in their house because Dan and Irene were going to be gone. And I thought, well, they must not know the story. So I give Dan a call on the phone and I said, hey, Dan, I uh, hear you're going to open your house up to so-and-so and so-and-so for a while. And he says, yeah. And I said, well, do you know anything about their story? Because, oh, yeah. And he tells me their whole story. And I said, so, you know, you live in Corrales, and that's where the rich slave owners live, you know, with the big houses. <laughs> and are you sure you want to do this, Dan? And he says, well, isn't it all stuff? And isn't it what we're supposed to do? <sighs> so I said, I hate you, and I put the phone down. <laughs> we opened our church up. Our decisions, they can bring refreshment to others, and they can change others, and this decision is going to impact the whole church. It's a big deal. And then verse 3. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that in a number of letters. Chris and then Shalom, that's Hebrew. That the grace is God's joy giving to us. Totally undeserved. His gift to me being able to grow up in a, in a, in a Christian home. I know something about marriage and family that I can go sometimes to CareNet and share some of what I learned at home growing up about marriage because it's grace. Because we're all broken. 
And we need that. And then the more we understand his grace, then the more we're able to give peace. The next verse, which we won't get into, it talks about faith and love, but the connection is the faith we have to, to Jesus, but the love we have for, for other saints. It's our faith in Christ that gives us the love for others. It's this understanding we're broken and we need his grace that gives us that love. Grace and peace. I've used this illustration a number of times before, so if you've heard it before, tough, I don't care. I'm the one who gets to be up here. Um, it's just, it's just I, the best one I've got and uh, for peace, because it it's a medical term for bones being mended, being at one again. And the illustration is uh, Micah, when he was a, a little tyke uh, in this bed, we, we, we'd stick him in the room for an hour. So here's my parenting advice. Stick him in a room for an hour every day, whether they need a nap or not. It doesn't matter if they fall asleep or not, just stick them in the room. So we stuck him in the room for our sanity for an hour, right? So what does he do? He had taken off his T-shirt and he thought he'd, he'd put his T-shirt on like a pair of underwear, right? Well, he gets one foot in and then the other foot hits and he tumbles off the little bed and his arm's like in an S, you know, when we pick him up. All my advice isn't great, but it, it worked for the other three. Um, so... We bring them in, and, uh, and the x-ray is bones are like this. And uh, so they have us leave the room and go down the hallway and go into the waiting room. But in the waiting room, we still heard the screams. I'll just never forget those screams because they've got to pull the bones apart and put them together. And I don't know why they can't do anything for pain. Maybe doctors are possessed, but anyway, that's what they do. <laughs> and so um, we come back in the room, and I'll never forget Michael looking at me through the tears, and I pick him up, and he said, Dr. Katz, mean Dr. Daddy. <laughs> but he wasn't, was he? He was putting his bones at peace again. So that they'd come together. This whole book is about putting Philemon and Onesimus at peace again. It's about putting the church that's all shattered and messed up with slavery and other issues at peace again. And you may have people in your life that you need to be at peace again with. And I am telling you, sometimes it'll make you scream. That doesn't mean God's a bad God. It's just what it takes to be at peace. It's taking grace to another level. One question that always comes up in this book is, why doesn't Paul just condemn slavery, hide Onesimus and condemn slavery outright? Well, of course, that's the whole political answer to the problem, and political answers tend to be more of a Band-Aid than a cure. I mean, not that they're bad. We need Band-Aids. But the gospel is about our reform. It's about our heart. It's about you and me keeping in step with the Spirit, and it's harder than a law, I think, Remember, I talked about Caleb last week and how he was at our house and I would leave the vacuum by the, 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 the smashed cereal, you know, that, that, that Megan's kids leave. And, and I would leave the, the dishwasher open, hoping maybe he'd get a hint, right? And maybe even the trash can. I'd take the can out of the can, you know, so it's ready to be dumped. And I'd come home and, and the dishwasher's still full and the can's still sitting there full and the vacuum hasn't been turned on. So finally I made him a list and said, you know, would you do these things? And, and he does them, but he kept the law. You know, I mean, I'm glad he did it. But anyway, so another day I made him another list and also the trash need to be brought out to the street, you know, the once a week thing. So I made him that list and, uh, and figured he'd do it. And, but then I came home the end of the day and, and I noticed trash cans out in front and, I, and it was stinking cold. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm from Winnipeg, but I don't do well under 80. And <laughs> I, I saw the cans, I thought, oh, I'm gonna have to get the cans, right? And I'm pulling the truck in, but our can's not in front. He not only brought it out in front, he had brought it back when it got emptied on his own. It was like, wow, this is, this is what it means to keep in step with the Spirit, and this is why it's harder than the law. Paul could have turned Onesimus in and followed the law, but he didn't turn Onesimus in. Onesimus doesn't have to go through to, to Colossae. He can run away anytime he wants. The question is, will he keep in step with the Spirit? Will he do what God's calling him to do? Not what he was calling every slave to do, what he was calling him to do. 
Will Philemon call him a fellow man and a brother, as Paul asks him? These are choices to keep in step with the Spirit. And I'm convinced that keeping in step with the Spirit is harder than keeping the list. It's allowing the Word of God to grow in our heart. It's more confusing. It takes constant conversation with God. There's tension. There's uncertainty. There's a waiting on God. And it may want to make you scream. But that's perfect. And that's exactly where God wants us. That's where hope and internal change show up. So just two things we need to do. One, we need to admit we've got a human problem and all of us have it. And go to God and repent of that and say, God, I need your help. And then, God, I want to keep in step with your spirit. Will you do that? Stand with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the grace that you show us. You don't make us into robots. You don't force us to do what's right. You don't drop a list from the sky of what we need to do tomorrow. But you give us the spirit inside and you give us the word that convicts. And Father, we ask for the conviction and the pulling of your spirit that we would be in step this year. In your name we pray. Amen.